And the next speaker is Professor Petro Memosdorf. He's the musician and also the professor on uh, musicology. And he mentioned he was born in Argentina and works in Europe and America. Uh, in Europe, two based from Barcelona, Spain, and also Venice, Italy. And he also taught in Harvard University and the University of California. And his topic is about the macro, macros, macrocosmos, right? Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for this wonderful invitation, Andrea, and the organizers. Um, I've rarely been in a conference where I've learned so much. So I'm very, very merciful for this and glad and proud to be here. <coughs> Sorry to start a little bit late. Perhaps I can catch up, it's not sure. <coughs> Music belongs to those areas of human expression in which the boundaries between tangible and intangible heritage has prompted centuries of reflection, from Plato to Isidore, from Galileo to Adorno. Sound and sound organization can only tangentially be fixed in writing, and sound performance as movement and acting, while fully dependent on its actual materiality, ironically has for centuries escaped material preservation. Nonetheless, musical philology has long established its place separated from text philology, though the definition of musical text as a material trace of music or else as musical event in itself keeps twisting minds and methods in all currents of musical thought. Music history, on the other side, has long proved revealing for other historical disciplines. Poetical texts and historical information often only circulated in musical settings, from Dante's and Petrarch's French quotations in the 14th century to revealing historical data hidden in monophonic and polyphonic song texts, motets, or madrigals in old times, just to name a few instances. Music has therefore become a fortunate research area, not only for the study of musical intertextuality, but also intermediality and even interculturality altogether. The present paper aims at describing microcosmos, a series of musical research projects that focuses on the interaction between different written and oral past musical cultures that shared common social cultural environments. Building on the historiography of celebrated multicultural examples, such as the Iberian, so Spanish, musical chapels in the 13th and 14th centuries, or the Flemish Italian music travelers in the 15th and 16th centuries, Microcosmos aims at contextualizing these interactions within the complex web of their historical and geographical backgrounds. Furthermore, Microcosmos privileges non-European areas, such as South and Central America, the East Mediterranean, or perhaps East and Southeast Asia, waking up inter alia the synergy between influences from and counter influences back to Europe. Each installment of Microcosmos will concentrate on one specific multicultural region and period, but share with the others a series of common goals and methodological approaches. The first main goal of Microcosmos is the detailed exploration of multicultural musical phenomena of the past, which include cases of juxtaposition, antagonism, interrelation, or hybridization of many kinds. This may provide new information or means 
of understanding or even reconstructing music of the past in actual critical performances, critical performances, be they oral or editorial. The second main goal derives from the first and consists in the exploration of the dependency of these musical phenomena from, but also their influence on, larger social contexts. This, in turn, may help reformulating the relationships between music history and other arts and sciences, on the one hand, and, perhaps more importantly, between music history and history altogether, on the other. Regarding the methodology, a few words on musical epistemology may suffice to set the background. As drafted by Guido Adler's Viennese school in the 1880s and frequently revised since, Western musical scholarship has long based its narrative on a paradigmatic and ethnocentric differentiation between systematic, historical and ethnographic musicology. More recent discussions, however, have softened or even overridden this differentiation, alongside with a number of new trends in the disciplinarian relationships between history and anthropology on the one hand, and between both and philosophy on the other. Therefore, a new anthropologization of the conventionally accepted fields of historical musicology, that is, the written musical traditions of the past Western world, has fostered the historicization of unwritten Western or non-Western musical cultures worldwide. Microcosmos methodology, in short, roots in the core of this discussion, for it combines systematic, historical, and ethnographic musicology, first, to identify historical geographical areas of analysis, and second, to define cross-border investigation instruments appropriate to each of them. These instruments include the customary historiographical contextualization, but also both ethnographic and philological analysis of music materials, as well as field and archival research in European and non-European institutions. Not least, historical research may interact with and be enriched by performance theory and historically informed musical performance itself, here as elsewhere, conceived in its heuristic capacity of an experimental cognitive tool. The first two installments of Microcosmos are planned for 2017 and 19 and 2019 21 respectively, and in the following I will detail the first of them and very briefly sketch the second. The first installment of Microcosmos is named Pygmalion and consists in a fresh historical and ethnographic inquiry of the interaction between different musical cultures operating in and around the French slave colony of Haiti in the 18th and early 19th century. Basing on the on your left is Cuba, for your orientation. Basing on the long-standing debates on the multicultural strains of Haitian history and society, marked by a multifaceted reception of indigenous American, sub-Saharan and European cultures, on the one side, and by the tensions between orthodox colonialism and the Enlightenment's conceptions of ethnocentrism and slavery, on the other, Pygmalion reconsiders 18th century musical issues as factors depending, but also influential, on larger social cultural phenomena in Haiti's history. These include the ethnocentric compartmentation, miscegenation, and overlapping of musical traditions, as well as the inter regional diasporas and meta hegemonic influences of Haitian musical cultures on the region and farther areas, such as Cuba. Guyana, Louisiana, other states in the US, France, or Europe in general. The mapping of these influences, as well as the comprehension of the complex web of relations within the French-dominated Caribbean Isles of Haiti, Guadeloupe, Grenade, and Martinique, 
as drawn from chronicle studies or deporix or archival research, took a quantum leap with Fouchard's and Stevenson's researches of the 1950s and 60s and was further enriched by Mintz, Price, Cous, and Fleurent, among others, in the last decades. Further inquiries were made by Lemon, Durand, and Bermudis, who proved paraliturgical contrafacta of airs and cantatas imported from France to have circulated in the French Caribbean and Gulf area, especially in the Concert Spirituel in the 1740s and 50s. Most recently, finally, David Powers has paved the way for new inquiries in the field of staged music, analyzing and comparing a number of understudied and underperformed Haitian repertories, including creolized forms of sub-Saharan dance and music, as well as local arrangements of Western religious and secular music, and above all, music theater, by the major French and European composers of the time. Haiti's first opera theater was only built in 1764, but by 1780, over 11 theaters were active on the island, premiering most of the productions presented in Paris and Versailles, and fostering an unprecedented process of creolization and local politicization of the hosted repertories. Most of this highly idiosyncratic material awaits further and detailed inquiry. Pygmalion will particularly concentrate on two of the above-mentioned repertories. First, the spiritual songs, contrafacta, transformations, from the Ursuline convent of New Orleans in its dissemination and reception in the French Caribbean. And second, the interaction between Afro-American traditions and the creolized European music theater of the time. Let me please detail the main goals in the inquiry of both repertories. In the field of spiritual song, the project aims at exploring the synergy between the Ursuline repertory and previous Haitian religious musical practices. As is well known, some of them were due to the Jesuits before their expulsion in 1763. Here, as elsewhere, engaged in the use of musical training as a means of religious conversion. In the related field of religious and para-religious music in general, a further task is the updated repertoriation and description of Haiti's concert spirituel in their interaction with the secular repertories. Central aspects are the local or imported origin and adaptation of compositions, their scoring and instrumentation, performance practices, and local and international reception. Not least, local or imported instruments, their possible hybridization with indigenous traditions and circulation in the region, may be compared with similar information partly available from Cuba, Mexico, or the Gulf area. Eventually, Research may also entail a new scrutiny of the circulation of Haitian or French Caribbean composers and performers in 18th and early 19th century France. Some of their biographies may well be obscured by their status of slavery or recent enfranchisement. And yet, they may cast new lights on some of the largest French and European orchestras of the time. Regarding the Haitian music theater, on the other side, new research is needed on the location and nature of venues before the construction of public theaters, a problem excluded from David Power's research. Another further interest must be given to the emergency of the entrepreneurship of occasional black theater owners, as well as to the social connections and artistic interaction between theaters and cabarets in the western and southern areas of the colony. But the main interest lies elsewhere. Namely, in the aforementioned creolization and political reuse of libretti and song texts, and the replacement of French courtly with local musical forms, and especially dances during and between theatrical settings. Pas de nègre, pas de esclave, and especially calenda dances, 
While severely forbidden in the early 18th century, there was a death penalty for people who danced African dance in Haiti. The only reason for death penalty on the islands. While forbidden in the early 18th century, increasingly replaced French conventional dances in Haitian opera and prose performances towards the end of the colony. Not least, of utmost importance, is the early inclusion of non-white players, and especially singers, and even title role singers, in Haitian stagings, in its complex relationship with the status of staged slavery and in the repertories imported. The 1781 Haitian casting of Rousseau's Pygmalion opera, with a black Galate protagonist, is only the first among several instances thematizing the otherness of black interpreters through the issue of the shared versus non-shared common self of the artist Pygmalion and his emancipated artwork Galate. La Mance d'Atue by Dalérac was performed by black singers twice in 1788, and Peinture Amoureux de son Modèle by the anti roussonian Egidio Dini was staged in Port-au-Prince and Cap Francais respectively in 1779 and 86. Evidently, the topic of the white lover of black beauty hinted at the thorny topic of interracial marriage and miscegenation in general with its many social consequences, including the racially determined seating policy of the theaters themselves. In other words, voicing the black slaved singer was both an incitement and gratification of mixed racial elite audiences, especially in the West, which notoriously remained a central issue until the end of the French colonial period and beyond. In fact, as discussed by countless authors, including Gardour, Willis, Bauman. After Haiti's revolution, the phenomenon found new venues in New Orleans, Charleston, Chicago, and elsewhere in the US. For the sake of better comprehending this vast and complex phenomenon, a selected number of theatrical settings issued between the 1770s and 90s will be subjected to comparative analysis. And eventually, a specific historical benefit evening issued at Port-au-Prince on February 13th, 1781, will be reconstructed in actual performance. A comédie mêlée d'Ariette, followed by a parodie créole, a number of local dances, and the final scène lyrique. The comédie mêlée d'Ariette is Favarble's Parisian favorite Isabelle et Gertrude, the Parodie Creole is a thoroughly reworked version of Rousseau's Divin de Village, here played in blackface and ended by a series of pas creole local dances. And the Saint Lyrique, finally, is Rousseau's here black casted Pygmalion, hence the title of the project as a whole. Summarizing. The project analyzes and reconstructs the first staging of juxtaposed black and black-faced white singers in Haiti as a means of musically reviving the early stages of a historical debates that not surprisingly enormously inflamed contemporary critics and still deserves refined discussion. The project foresees an international conference, publications, seminars, and an itinerant music festival hosted in the Caribbean and co-sponsored by European and Caribbean institutions during the period 2017 to 19. European sponsoring institutions include the University of Tours and the Centre de Musique Baroque de Versailles in France, the Fondazione Giorgio Cini in Venice, Italy, and the Festtage Alte Musik Basel in Switzerland. Regional institutions include Casa de las Americas of La Habana in Cuba, the Universidad Nacional de Bogota in Colombia, and the universities of Miami, New Orleans, Harvard, and Columbia in the US.
Concluding, the first installment of Microcosmos shall set the ground for further researches in the history of musical multiculturality in the Afro-American French Caribbean in its complex interaction with a multifaceted shared space. The second installment of Microcosmos will only be summarized here, for it features the same major goals and methodological approaches of the first. The targeted historical context changes dramatically, however, and so do the musical materials to be explored. The project is called Fons Ortorum after one of its main musical subjects, and it concentrates on the complex interaction between different East Mediterranean musical traditions in the late 14th and 15th centuries, including those practiced by the Byzantine, Venetian, Genovese, and French enclaves in the Peloponnese, East and South Aegean, Latin East, Crete, and especially Cyprus. Basing on and expanding standard historical scholarship, Fons Sortorum will re-examine a number of related musical sources and their reception in the period concerned. They include, among others, two major manuscripts related to the French court of Cyprus in the late 14th and early 15th century. One of them, manuscript 17330 of the National Library in Paris, contains the monophonic rhymed office Fons Ortorum, composed in the early 1370s by the Dominican friar Rostanius for the Western importation of the Byzantine feast of the presentation of the Virgin Mary at the temple. Already celebrated by the Latin churches in Cyprus in the mid-1300s, the feast became a veritable multimedia including a procession, a quite stunning liturgical drama with 22 theatrical characters and two staged musicians on a precisely designed and colorfully customed theatrical setting, a Gregorian monophonic office and the final Marian mess. Despite a fairly thorough literature on the single components of the feast, the contextual analysis of the whole is still awaited as is the codicological assessment of the Parisian manuscripts and its contemporary partial concordance, manuscript Latin 14454 in the same library. Both manuscripts contain unexplored hints at their poetic and musical performance, as well as detailed witnesses of their highly relevant political context and reception. In this regard, it may be useful to recall that Fons Ortorum was sponsored by the royal chancellor and lay Carmelite biographer Philippe de Mezières, whose program foresaw launching the feast, perhaps first in Dominican and Carmelite, and then in general monastic circles in Venice, Avignon, Paris, and the Western world. According to a vast historiography, including Jorda, Hughes, Coleman, Buchner, Blumenfeld, and so forth, Messier's unionist goal was to officialize, at the same time, a Marian devotion particularly cherished by Cypriot Carmelites, and to please the Byzantine church in order to obtain its unconditional support against Saracen and Ottoman threats. The legitimation of the feast and the office, in short, was notoriously part of a major diplomatic design. The other Cyprus source is the celebrated Codex J29 hosted by the National Library in Torino, a monumental collection of both sacred and secular monophonic and polyphonic music, most likely composed in and for the French Cypriot court of Janus of Lusignan around 1410 to 30 and possibly copied from some lost exemplar in Brescia, Lombardy in the 1430s. Its historiography is quite impressive as well, though many research areas remain obscure. One of them consists in the origin of its perhaps partially autochthonous monophonic offices, analyzed in a yet unpublished work by Baibar Haig. And another one is the totally endemic nature of its over 200 polyphonic settings, 
none of which is found in any continental concordance, a unique case in the whole of the European Middle Ages. At any rate, both repertories, Paris 17330 and Torino J29, testify for a strong link between the political religious networking of the French Cypriot court in the region and its fervent and varied musical activity. As for the multiculturality of these repertories, Messier's feast is set in manuscript Latin 17330, I paraphrase, to have been perched from some of its original, thus oriental elements before its pr performance in Avignon and Paris, which scholars such as Hughes, Boyce, and Coleman refer to Greek Orthodox liturgical strains that had to be removed before papal approval in 1372. Oriental elements may also have included some poetical, musical, or theatrical strains, however, resulting from the feast's original Eastern environment. They still need historical and musicological inquiry. Fonsortorum's multicultural hybridization, moreover, also appears in a number of backward-sounding Dominican or perhaps even Hildegardian melodic features, if not direct quotations. They may or not relate to the political discourse conveyed by the newly imported Marian feast, which may have symbolized, among various issues, nothing less than female learnedness and even female monastic self-determination in the context of the new status of female Carmelites and, more generally, of female mendicants altogether. The importance of these issues can hardly be overestimated, and so it is hoped that future art, religion, and gender scholars will refine research in this direction. The Codex Torino J29, on its side, exemplifies as well a number of concealed multicultural hybridizations as well, its 33 French-styled motets, for instance, display unusual melodic leaps that possibly recall endemic chant traditions. However, some of their structural features, such as equal disc and isorhythm, can only be explained through a thorough knowledge of Venetian traditions of the period. How did they reach Cyprus? Likewise, some of its all unique 168 French texted and French styled songs, although naming local toponymics, occasionally quote central or northern Italian polyphonic compositions. Why? May they hint at some direct influences perhaps occurred in the non French enclave of the islands, Genovese and cosmopolitan Famagusta? Or perhaps at other indirect ties with Genova or Venice? May Messier's permanent link to Venice have fostered other musical multicultural contacts than thus far emerged? How Italian was Messier's background? Finally, besides Cyprus, the, conceit, the concerned repertory includes forms of simple polyphony in the style of Venice, issued in and for the use of Orthodox Crete, in the 14th and 15th centuries, as well as one case of Greek text that learned polyphony adduced in the Italian Adriatic coast and perhaps Venice in the 1460s or 70s. As I've shown elsewhere, the only manuscript transmitting the latter piece was interestingly copied by a Carmelite circulating in Italy, Johannes Bonadies, who found his exemplar in the Carmelite library of Mantua in the fall of 1473. Thorough scholarship on his whereabouts is still missing. Summarizing then, the second installment of Microcosmos will reconsider political, religious, and artistic inter- and intra-confessional relationships between Greek Orthodox and Roman Catholics, Dominicans, Augustinians, and Carmelites in the East and West, and among the latter, conventuali and congregati Carmelites, that is, followers and detractors of the 15th century Carmelite Reformation. Their music may hint at their connections and shifts within the Latin and Greek, Mameluk and Ottoman political web of the late medieval Mediterranean. As mentioned, 
Also, the second installment of Microcosmos Fonsortorum shall include an international conference and itinerant musical festival. In the conference, a number of art and music historians, historians of politics, trade, culture or religion will share different views on the concerned repertories and their social, cultural reception and origin. In the festival, finally, mixed local and international musicians shall circulate in Cyprus, Rhodes, Patmos and Venice and be sponsored by same, some of the same institutions named before, the universities of Utrecht, Tours and Torino, already agreed, the International Musicological, Musicological Society, the ESMUG in Barcelona, Fondazione Cini in Venice and Festtage Alte Musik in Basel. In short, Fonsortorum in Cyprus like Pygmalion in Haiti, engages multidisciplinarian and multi-institutional cooperation. To finish, no conclusions, can be, no conclusions can be drawn from future plans, except for general reflections on possible working methods. Here music has been suggested as a tip of an iceberg of multicultural phenomena and musical theatrical, indeed artistic performance as a cognitive complement to conventional scholarship. Two sites have been chosen, Baroque Haiti and medieval Cyprus. Two isles where multicultural crossroads produced unique connections and mixtures, as well as deep cultural conflicts that partly persist. May microcosmos bring back at least some of the sound scope of their past, and may the criticism of this culturally varied, extraordinary audience help challenging or at least nuancing these sketched ideas. Thank you. Thank you.